Great. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the 100th System Thinking Ontario session, which is a scary thing to think about. That we've had 100 monthly meetings at this point. Um, and I don't see any stop from this, so I guess we're going on for a while. So for today's talk, we have Zad Khan, who's uh, got an interesting position as um, firstly a graduate of the SFI program, and secondly, uh, as um, part of the System Changes Learning Circle. And so uh, we have various people in that are regular System Thinking Ontario that are part of the circle. And so we each have our different views on it, and uh, we'll uh, find out what Zad has to say about this. But first we'll do the usual, we'll go around and we'll do introductions. So I'll just stop that screen share. Stop share. Oh, oh that's it. It's a big group. <laughs> yeah, how do we make this fast? Uh, I'm just trying to stop my screen share right now. You um, stopped, there. you're good. Yeah, I'm it good? is. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's still recording though. I'm still recording. It says I'm in screen sharing, but that's how it managed to stop that. That's interesting. Okay, so uh, let me find my screen back here. Return to meeting. Oh, we're up to 24. That's uh, a. Yeah. Okay, that so was... let let me bring my list back up again. And where are we here? How about we Sorry, just have people this. introduce who want to? Uh, let me work down the list a little faster. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, who? Okay. Someone came in as forty-seven. Who's forty-seven? He might be down. I, I know the photo. That's that's, a, that's our classmate Serge. Yeah. <laughs> 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 AKA Agent Forty Seven. Maybe that's what he goes with. Serge, you want to say hi? Yeah, hi. I am not sure why I cannot change my name anymore. <laughs> Let's see what's going on here. Um, uh, this had to do with my citizenship ceremony, so I'm now a full-fledged Canadian. Uh, <laughs> oh, congratulations. Thank you. And uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to figure it out. But like, I think I know at least a third of the people on the call. It's really nice to see everybody. And uh, congratulations once again, Zad. Um, could you just tell us uh, who you are and, um, and how you come to System Thinking Ontario? Um, well, uh, from invitation from Zad, um, I also did the same strategic foresight and innovation program. And I, um, I'm working with Mars uh, as a senior associate of design and qualitative analysis. So we do a lot of um, systems thinking, design thinking type of work, mostly in like policy regulatory um, type of innovation space. Great, thanks. Eve, say hi. Oh, you're muted, Eve. I was saying I'm not a Canadian, although there's certainly been times I wished I was. Um, and I'm in Chicago and I teach in the, the doctorate in public health program um, for experienced public health leaders in at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And I'm an anthropologist by training, but came into anthropology because of Gregory Bateson's work. So I've been interested in systems thinking theory practice for a long time. And, and I also um, practice as an evaluator. Thanks. Uh, Gil? Hey there, I'm Jill. Um, ah. I uh, used to work in brand strategy and recently started a new role in corporate strategy. And I came here through Zad because Zad and I used to work together. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. Say hi, Griff. Hey, everybody. Uh, I am also here at Zad's Beckoning. However, I am also a bit of a staple at this point uh, in this crew. Pleasure to meet y'all. Uh, I've been uh, hanging around Systems Thinking Ontario for a couple of years. Uh, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to this evening. Thanks very much. Thanks. Iman? Hi. Um... 
I'm also here because of this invitation. I'm the least uh, of uh, least familiar with the systems thinking, but I'm here to see and uh, enjoy this presentation. Thanks, John. Hi, I'm uh, John Castle. I'm I live in Champaign, Illinois. I work for Indigo Agriculture. I'm here at Zed's invitation. Uh, I come to this program through the strategic program. I think I might have been Peter's first graduate student. I'm wow. <laughs> Hey, thanks. Uh, Kelly, say hi. Hi. Um, what, what was John's uh, John's message uh, broken up, or is it it my? It could be mine. No, I just it's on. To... It, it was on his side. Okay. I, I, I'm Kelly Okamura. Um, David tells me that I that I've been one of the longstanding people on systems changes uh, uh, group and. I came through Peter Jones in terms of design with dialogue. Thanks. Leslie? Good luck. <laughs> hey there, uh, Leslie Folds, SFI graduate. Um, I am currently a manager of corporate initiatives for the region of Durham, working on their strategic uh, initiatives. And I'm always excited to hear what Zad says. So I'm really excited to get back in touch with this community. Thanks. Uh, Mike, say hi. To me, mean me. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, Michael Troop. Um, I'm a SFI alumnus. Uh, I'm an engineer. Um, and Dad reached out to me a few months ago. Um, and uh, we've had some nice uh, discussions. Um, so I'm happy to be here to hear what he has to say tonight. Thanks. Madeline? Hi. I'm a coming to you from Northern California. Um, I'm part of a group of PhD students at Carnegie Mellon um, who connected with Zad over some of our thinking around um, theories of change and systems change. Yeah, happy to first call and joining with you all. Thanks. Mo Elsby, who's calling from a long ways away. Yeah, I think I've got my camera on. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I'm Mo from the UK. I am a UN conflict advisor. And I, um, I well, firstly, I came across David's work um, more than a year ago, and I've been interested in following David's work for the last year. And I've also been having really interesting conversations with Zaid, and he's in here yeah, very generously extended the invitation and I'm here to, you know, to learn and uh, uh, to meet you all. So uh, it is, it's quite late here as well. So I'll try my best to, to stay as long as possible, uh, but um, we'll, with your permission, kindly uh, leave in about an hour's time or so. So just to give you a heads up. But with that, pleasure to meet everyone. And I look forward to, to the um, presentation. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Badra, say hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, first off, it's a genuine pleasure to be part of the group and join everyone today. Um, yeah, my name is Badra. I live in Toronto. Believe it or not, it just uh, I only knew about the existence of uh, Ontario system thinking only three days ago. <laughs> and uh, thanks to David invitation, um, I am uh, I had the pleasure actually to be invited to the meeting today and I'm looking forward to meet everyone, learn a lot about system thinking and resume like a journey started about two years ago now. So still taking my baby steps here, but uh, definitely a big, uh, like a big interest and a big ex uh, excitement about being part of this group. Thank you everyone. Thanks. N. Halverson. Hi there. Hi. I'm Neil. Hi. Uh, thanks, Zed, for inviting me. I'm an SFI grad as well. And uh, I work in building industry technology engineering company right now, where I'm actually allowed to apply a little bit of systems thinking there uh, right now in terms of 
uh, journey, customer journey mapping, which is sort of systems thinking if you can put enough variables in there. So happy to be here and look forward to hearing you, Zed. Thanks. Ryan, say hi. Oh, is Ryan muted? That is me muted because I've been on too many of these calls today <laughs> and I just auto mute myself. Uh, thanks, uh, Zed, for uh, inviting me. Uh, you said this was Fight Club and I was really curious how it was going to work over Zoom. So I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm ready to rock and roll. <laughs> thanks. Uh, Salman. Uh, just switching on the camera. Okay. Um, SFI grad, uh, Peter's student and fan of David Ng. Uh, also a fan of Zed. Uh, looking forward to this presentation. Thanks. Uh, Sama? Hi, everyone. My name is Sama Kamamaz, and I am a, a master's design uh, candidate in strategic foresight innovation. Uh, program. I took the systemic design course with Dr. Peter Jones and naturally systemic design and systems thinking makes its way to my research, which is around um, complete communities and transit oriented development. And um, I had a few conversations with that before uh, about the work that he's doing and um, looking forward to see the presentation today. Thanks. Sergio. No, oh, Agent 47. I, just, I, I managed to change my name back from 47. <laughs> <laughs> you put Sergio in brackets 47. Yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, Stephen, say hi. Stephen Davies. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll be brief. Uh, Steve Waddell, say hi. I'll be a bit longer. Uh, I'm in Western Massachusetts. Uh, I'm a, um, I've been working on uh, transformation issues for over 40 years. I'm a fan of Peter's work and he introduced me to Zide and I'm now a fan of Zide's work too. Thank you. Thanks. Susu, is it late for you? You wanna say hi? Oh yes, it's very, very late, David. Hi, hi everyone. Thanks, Sad. I'm here because you invited me. Great to be here. Um, been in systems for a long time. Here's Elena. Um, this is here. You don't need to introduce me. <laughs> Let's say hi, Elena. We've, we're in Spain. We've been working um, on create a systemic research platform. We're both co directors of that institute. So, hi. Thanks. Since I was on a call with her 10 hours ago, it's late now. <laughs> so, um, Yihu, say hi. Well, a little shy, got on mute. Hi, I'm ah. founding a public op opinion research institute in China. I'm here for learning. I'm not scared of speaking English, so. Okay, thanks. Uh, Zach, I haven't seen you in a while. Hey, good to see you guys. Yeah, it's, it's I've been away for a while, but glad I was able to catch this, um, Zach's presentation. Um, I, uh, my how I came to systems thinking Ontario is I years and years ago when I was doing my undergrad in uh, mechanical engineering I had a thought that um, something that would be really valuable would be potentially to study like some universal principles of like systems like viable systems model actually what I ended up finding uh, after years of thinking this, but not doing anything with it. I found my way to Stafford Beer's work. And uh, then uh, when I moved to Toronto, I found this group and it's, which has been a, amazing to be a part of like uh, over the years, even though I've been away for a while. So and I'm in uh, mechanical engineering um, development and manufacturing of medical devices uh, consulting these days. So thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dan, you want to say hi? Just a minute here. Okay, I'm going to say something that's going to embarrass both uh, David and Zad here. 
So what it is, and I come from system changes learning circles, so I've got a lot of exposure with these guys. And I'm going to tell you, it's just a ton of fun when they're in the room together and they're bantering, just a ton of fun. So hopefully you'll be able to see that today. You learn so much when you get these two guys asking each other questions, or maybe David's one to ask a question, I don't know. Maybe Zad's one answering. I'm not sure who's answering what, but it's going to be a fun thing today, guys. Okay. Less bantering from me today. I'm just moderating. Uh, Peter, say hi. Hi, I think I know almost everyone in, in the virtual room. It's, uh, I look forward to uh, Zad's discussion. This is part of a, a really a body of work that he's developed as a graduate. And, uh, and, just, have to, and uh, just have to say you probably, especially those who are in or from the SFI program, um, can appreciate that it's grade day, grading. And so I have to have all the, all, all the grades from the synthesis maps and briefs in today, all the comments, which, you know, there's a lot there. So Jeremy Bose and I are finishing that and that might be why he didn't join us. But uh, so happy to be here tonight. Okay, so we'll hand it over to Zad. He's gonna go to screen share, I think, and I'll be managing mute and uh, people that want to get in the queue on questions, I'll be monitoring the chat as well. All yours, Zad. Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah, let me just set up my monitors because I actually want to look at uh, the camera. So I'm going to switch my monitors. Screen sharing is okay. Good. Okay, cool. Uh, there we go. Yep. Awesome. Well, honestly, thank you so much to everyone that's joined. Like, it's really, <laughs> it's, it's funny because I was telling, like, I was just commenting earlier, like, I can present to RSD or whatever, no problem if it's like strangers, but all the friends and people that I know, I get a little more nervous, but I really do appreciate you taking the time out, especially with all the pressing matters at hand. Like it, it means a lot for you to come out. So I genuinely appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna jump right into it uh, because we, uh, a lot of us know each other and et cetera. But um, I'm gonna start from the end. In the end, the, the one word takeaway is rhythm. So if I put you to sleep, which may happen, then the one thing you can remember now before you go to speed, sleep, especially Mo in the UK, is rhythm. Uh, so you just take that away. Um, and then, and so the point of this presentation is actually an invitation. It's an invitation to designers to appreciate when to act and when to non-act. So I've, I've started with the end and then we'll, we'll kind of find our way there. Um, just setting some context, because as Peter mentioned, this is a body of work. Um, I didn't know it's a body of work until I started working on it, but it's appearing that way. Um, and so I'm kind of picking up where I left off at the end of my own major research project. This was back in September, at the end of the summer 2020, uh, of 2020. Um, and I started to reflect on the role of humility in design. It kind of came about through the work I was doing in my MRP, which isn't actually on humility, but it was on like systems communications and, and an idea that I had in there. But here in the presentation from September at the um, Systems Think Ontario presentation, I kind of threw in this little piece, even in my, even in my, whoops, even in my paper, I threw it in knowing, I hope like, you know, no one's gonna read it. So I kind of wanted to throw it in about questioning, um, you know, the biases towards action in design and the need to appreciate perhaps in action, especially with, uh, you can imagine everything that was going on in the year 2020 at the time. Um, and looking at, you know, where is their wisdom and non-intervention and, and a lot of the influence that I was having with uh, Peter Jones and David Ng through discussions and other, other folks, even on this call through different circles as well, had influenced a lot of that. So I'm continuing that body of work. Um, and then just to get it out of the way early, design here will be referred to as designing. <laughs> and it's, it's part of the verbiage, it's kind of a funny trick to play is can you verb eyes? Can you verbize? Based, I don't know. Can you turn everything into a verb to um, get to this process-oriented viewpoint? And you'll see that played out, but I just wanted to get that out of the way. So designing. Um, and then secondly, designing here refers to the domain of designing in three and four. So I always run into this, right? You say, oh, I'm a designer. Well, like, how's your logo, your poster, your products, your services? Oh, okay, okay. It's not, not that type of design. It's organizations, systems, industries, communities, countries, planets. So design in the domain of three and four. Uh, this is from GK Van Patter's uh, Rethinking Design Thinking, and Peter Jones also had a hand in this. Um, and that is where the wicked problems, I don't have a high quality scan of the other one, but that is where the wicked problems sit. 
um, in the in the arena of three and four, a really complex uh, social systems arena. Um, and I don't, uh, for those that may or may not be familiar with the wicked problems, this is not a presentation that will go into it, but basically they are unsolvable problems. In fact, calling them problems is a bit of a misnomer. They're wicked messes or issues. Um, yeah. And the other piece of context is I'm looking at designing through this research work called System Changes Learning. So this is a project that was initiated in 2019. It's like a 10 year project. We're three years into it. Um, and there's a lot of like rich foundations that David Ng and Dan and Kelly and everyone are assembling together. Um, we were contributing it, to it in some ways, um, but it's not a deep dive into system changes learning. <laughs> I, I also wanna get that out of the way. Just know that it has a methodology you can learn more about it, connect with David, connect with the team. They'll happily invite you. We have open sessions and things like that. And there's a lot of, yeah, banter, bantering that goes on uh, as well. But there is a body of work. This is not a deep dive into it. I just, it's more of just a shallow scoop of what's, what's there. And lastly, if there's any ideas and critiques in it, it honestly is directed at myself. Like, you know, that, that idiom of when you point your finger, there's three pointing back at you. It's kind of like that, right? There's a little bit of projection maybe happening. So any critique or anything like that, I, I say to myself first and foremost, and then I kind of share it with you all. Okay, so that's, that's the context. I, I, it was a little long or thorough, but I just want to get them uh, all out of the way. Um, now we go into thinking about rhythms. That was that key word, right? Really thinking about rhythm. Why, why is that a way into this? Um, so appreciating rhythms is literally a story about water skiing versus surfing. Hang with me now. So um, water skiing is this activity that actually emphasizes intention. You, you, you kind of approach that activity with that intention that you're gonna go water skiing. You have this mechanism, this boat is powered. It causes the wakes. Those wakes kind of ripple out. You can surf, you can wakeboard or water ski side by side. And it's a mechanistic thinking and it uh, adds causality. It's, it's thinking causality. I'm causing the waves to occur and then causing the ability to water ski, et cetera. So um, yeah, that, that's kind of the emphasis on in, intention. But when we think about surfing, it actually emphasizes attention. So you, you can intend to go surf, but you might not go surf that day. You're placing your attention on the weather, the location, the currents, the wind, all these types of variables that are happening. And essentially to do it successfully, you're responding to those natural rhythmic shifts of both the ocean and the people around you. And so this is why this photo, like this person took a spill, right? And this person, when you're lined up, you actually have to, there's a little bit of like an etiquette about which way you're gonna take the surf and the right lineup and things like that. So essentially you're thinking about living systems in this metaphor and it's propensity, propensity, I'll expand on that uh, in a second versus, versus causality. So it's a really different way of conceiving about how you engage with the system uh, as this metaphor and how you respond and react to it. So let's break that down. I'm gonna unpack rhythms through three ideas of the many, by the way, there's many ideas, but three which had an impact on me and my thinking. Again, I'm telling you what I've absorbed and maybe my designing, so let's see. Um, the first is about seeing reality as a process. So that's, that's one of the three things. The second is understanding the potential of a situation. Um, and the third thing that really had an impact on me was knowing from the inside. So I'll, I'll, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit and this is where it gets a little dicey, but let's, let's go through and we can come back out. Uh, seeing reality as a process is something that emphasizes temporality as opposed to changelessness. So the concept is when you think about a structure, it's an arrangement in space. But when you think about a process, it's an arrangement in time. And through this body of work, as well as others, we're actually looking at process first. So it completely reorients your vantage point. So if you were to look at a mountain, for example, you can actually recall that that seemingly structure is actually a really slow process. And this starts to really greatly affect how you look at the world. So one takeaway, a takeaway for me amongst many is like, Inserting this thought of over time as a consideration to designing allows you to see the potential. And it's like a fun experiment to play with yourself is can you add the word over time to everything that you think about, <laughs> literally? Um, it, it actually just starts to like, it's almost like a little mental hack. It starts like messing with you like, oh yeah, over time. Okay, things are that way, but over time they may not be. So it's really, um, it's, a re it's really had a profound impact on the way that I think. The second one is uh, understanding the potential energy of a situation. And so this emphasizes propensity as opposed to causality. 
So the concept is that everything has a natural tendency or a predisposition within them that is inevitable over time. So connecting it to what I just mentioned. So as a strategist, if you're thinking about it that way, your, your kind of goal is to harness the potential energy of that situation to your advantage, to your goal, to your outcome. Um, and when we think about the inevitable uh, aspect of it and the potential, you know, if a water dam breaks, that water has no choice but to rush forth. You're going to use it to move boulders out of the way. You're going to use it to take a, I don't know, a natural shower under those under that waterfall, whatever it is. Um, there, there's that natural tendency. So the impact that this had on me in a takeaway was just really trying not to force a change that goes against something's natural tendency. And that's been still is a process of learning about how not to do that, basically. Um, and that requires you to understand a thing's nature in and of itself. And it gets, I know it's getting a little woozy philosophical here, but uh, I really do mean that, 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 there, that there are elements that have a predisposition. So coming to terms with that is a really, has a really deep effect on how you engage from a design perspective with systems. And lastly is uh, knowing from the inside. So knowing from the inside as opposed to obviously the outside. So this is about paying attention to what the system has to tell us about itself. Um, and you know, a funny example is like, you know, if you're a parent and you're potty training your child, only the child really knows when they have to go. Like you as a parent can't know that. You can proxy it, get an alert, train them, have some system, you can look at their physical behavior or whatever. Um, but that knowing that comes from the inside is just like, oh, I feel like how to go. Okay, I'm using water and I'm using that example. Number one, there's a lot of metaphors interconnecting here, but you kind of get the idea. There's a type of knowing that only comes from within. And that's really interesting thought to sit with. Um, and so I actually took this in a different direction, by the way, from my takeaways. I actually think about media habits, especially today, especially with a lot of the conversation that's going around around those words. I'm not going to throw them out there, but those things that's happening. So I asked, I often ask myself, like, what's asking for my attention and why? And from where is it asking my attention? It starts to really, yeah, you start to really be self-critical about where you're paying, spending your energy in the day. And uh, you're also your valuable attention, which is which can get really interesting. You go down some interesting rabbit holes when you start thinking that way. Um, and you do start to have less confidence really about knowledge of complex phenomenon or issues or systems from the outside, you know? It's really, yeah. And that might be a counter trend to a lot of the discussion or types of dialogue that we have today. So those were kind of the three things that, you know, going into rhythms really stood out for me. Um, those were just a few of the many concepts that system changes learning draws upon. Like we're kind of over here in this area, but there's a whole history and there's more practice theory that I won't get into for the context of this, but, but it's there and, and, we're, and we're kind of building it all together, which is really exciting. But then the question comes up, where does designing and even humbling fit into all this, right? So I talked about these ideas from system changes learning. Um, and I think that's where now you can see my design 1.0. This is my skills right here. Um, designing is actually trying to water ski. And it's almost as if it's being pulled along by the clients on this boat from like the D1, D2 uh, arenas all the way to the complex issues and messes or the hurricanes of D3 and 4. Um, especially when, oh, I didn't finish the sentence, when surfing may be another consideration or approach at it. So that's kind of where I'm seeing my observation, my humble observation of design. Um, and I don't, I didn't mean to pick on this, but when I was putting this presentation together, uh, I came across this. So I'm just going to play it. It's only 30 seconds. What if positive change was only one design away? Life change, a career change, or a change in the conversation? One design beginning with one thought. We say design is beyond most people's reach. We say it's already in your hands. So, what will you design today? So you can kind of see the connection. I know I'm picking on. By the way, Canva, if you're watching, please don't pull my account. I still need to use you a couple of times, but um, you can kind of see the connection of between this indication of where design is being associated. They just hit off all the check marks, right? Of like all the the atypical things that you might associate with. And I'm not so sure that's the type of designing we're thinking about when we're wrestling with those really complex issues and systems. Um, and then, you know, I'll argue against myself. I'll say, okay, Zad, let's bring it down a notch, okay? When we get into those systems, we're looking at, 
multi-stakeholder engagements, getting a whole system in the room and all those elements. I totally get it. Capacity building, alliances, all that stuff. When you look at system changes and social innovation, no problem. Then my next question then is, and this is, I'm trying to land this slide, it didn't really come out, but like, should designing buy into that same level of, uh, okay, confidence of intent, right? The confidence of rah, 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 we're going to go out there and this is what we're going to achieve and this is how we're going to do it. And it's like, well, like even today, today's May 9th, catalyzing change, this is coming across my inbox, right? I'm like, is there another way to be designing with that humility? And what's the role of humility? Can we be designing with greater humility and what we know, do, say, appeal, communicate, act, invite, befriend, or whatever? Um, is it less contrived? Is it more like a sage, like just guiding to attention to what to look for in that, in that ocean? Here's the tide, you know, there's a couple of currents that came in the past few weeks. Watch out for those. There's people over on that side. They're catching them different ways, blah, blah, blah. Like you're just kind of co going out there together. Um, is designing the pursuit of better questions towards like practical wisdom uh, versus like having the pursuit of ideals in a short term. I know that's really conceptual and we can unpack that in the discussion, but um, there's ideas there and the kairos, that inner, that inner rhythm of when you know something's right, when you, when you find that when the opportune moment is, is present. Um, is that a different, completely different orientation to engaging with change, to engaging with large scale systems? And we're starting to see that shift in attention. I know I'm picking on, you know, design thinking in a box or certified theory of change, but like, a good example is Peter Jones and Ryan Murphy's work on theories of systemic change. And I didn't plan for this two years or three years ago, two years ago, Patricia drew this, you know, there's waves. So keeping the metaphor consistent, but Peter was pointing out to a lot of his colleagues and a lot of people working in the, uh, with theories of change in the system of change field about the incomplete, vague, linear and ideal components of it. Um, and I think it's a really interesting movement that we're starting to see against what I would call, and we can talk about this in the discussion, the thingification. So the thing becomes a thing and the idea gets lost, right? And so once you're so narrowly looking at design thinking as a thing, you kind of lose out on what it can be applied to and how to humbly approach its, its content. So finally, moving into the last section here, um, connecting this all to humility, you know, is, is, is where I want to kind of bring us, and that's where I started, was paying attention to those rhythmic shifts and thinking rhythmically and thinking about time and invites that type of learning about how the natural situation is unfolding. This is the way that this is the way it's going. And that, that then you can really appreciate, okay, it's a timely, there's a timely way to act, but equally a value. And what I don't see in the design community is when to not act, you know, when do you not intervene? And that may require that humbling. Um, I kind of have like a mental joke, like imagine all the case studies that like we work on and get awarded for. Imagine like the case study write up was like, we observed all these things. And so we didn't do anything. <laughs> like you should award award that award that group you know and they achieved it without without doing anything what a wonderful idea i know it's a bit of a juxtaposition joke but um it's just a different way of thinking about it and so getting a little bit more personal uh one more time with how this affected me and my streams of work um you know humbling designing kind of three ways one i talked about at the beginning like basically not communicating with confidence of or from a single perspective. Okay, irony alert, I know, we'll get to that. But, um, you know, systems communication was something I was working on, just thinking about in the early days. And I'm trying to bring some of those practices to like an academic or knowledge arena. So we did some policy report communication. Even in that, by the way, remember when I said criticism self, so a lot of this is directed at myself. But even in that, the things I'm most proud of is just saying like, just like the copywriting language of like, has the potential for, may lead to, you know, could impact. The degree, even just a small degree of certainty is like, it invites another view and it, it tries to humble yourself that you may not really know despite your epistemological kind of foundation. Uh, the other element is just working with more interactive modes of creative communication. So this is a project where we tried to like, basically turning visual maps and giga maps into interactions or exhibit design or multi-perspective documentaries. There's, there's a lot of, affordances in terms of the creative and digital platforms that we use that could do this type of communication. But ideologically, we're not even there. Everyone's kind of like, no, no, you have to come in and here's the 10 bullet points that you have to promote. And this is the policy chain. Well, it's like, well, what about, what about this way? What about inviting more? Um, the second way is uh, actually about being in awe of and working on the infrastructure that sustain us. This is a more recent one for me. I mean, I used to work on infrastructure and now I'm kind of like boomeranging back to it. Um, like 
maintenance culture is like a beautiful thing. And um, it just starts, and I know I use a lot of like hippy dippy ocean stuff and uh, I'm, not even, I'm not even on that vibe. I'm also like equally in awe of like urban development. Like it's, it's, it's kind of incredible when you think about what we can achieve, like, oh my God, that street light goes on every evening. Like it just knows how to do that or you get water from your tap. Another joke I think about is like, imagine the um, idea generator designer in like the elevator safety council meeting. <laughs> they would be like, they, they wouldn't know what to do with that person. They'd be like, okay, what if we, no, no, you can't do that. What if we, no, no, you can't, what if, and it's just like, look, we just need the magnets to work. The, the, the wires need to be held together and we just need to maintain elevator safety. It's like, thank God for that, right? So it's a completely different orientation about what you emphasize. And it actually made me appreciate, um, appreciate that quite a bit, maybe even more so than sometimes we accidentally knock on this stuff when it's like, actually, regardless of what protest you're going to, you're going to need to drink some water. Um, and lastly, this one gets a little bit more into uh, a deeper personal connection about reacquiring concepts from traditions that endure uh, and applying them today. And so personally speaking, you know, I have a, I have a relationship that with uh, an Islamic foundation that maybe I didn't, uh, on a personal level, maybe I didn't retrieve a lot of values from. I'm starting to look into that more and a couple of folks on the call uh, are here for that reason, actually. And so the Khalil Center is an interesting example because they had they took an approach to Islamic psychology. Um, I haven't like actually used them or seen their output, but the academic body of work that they put together was like a really beautiful template of like, I mean, they simplified it here, but now and I'm jokingly just cropping the word designing on top of it, but you can look at this tradition, uh, for example, an Islamic tradition, and they're not going to say design. And of course, the architecture stuff is all addressed. I'm talking about level three and four. But um, you can look at these concepts and see like 1400 plus years of resilience. And, and it's not just Islamic, there's other traditions that are equally long. So could you borrow those ideas? What can you retrieve from it? In a sense, it's a renaissance in a way. And how might you apply that today? And I think they've done a great job from the psychology, mental health and psychotherapy perspective. And I'm curious to know what that might be like at the designing three, three and four level uh, at a larger envelope. And, and often even in the systems thinking circle, just to um, throw some more shade, it's like, they'll often go from like, oh, there's this guy Aristotle, right? And then you jump forward to like Newton. I was like, well, there's a lot of people in between there that were thinking about the systems and system thinking that just weren't, that you're not gonna do a Google search in the year, you know, 962, did someone say uh, systems thinking? So it's not gonna show up that way. Kind of have to mind for it. Okay, so that was, I know I threw a lot. I threw a lot, I oscillated between the personal and, and, the, and the overview level, but I just threw this together at the end and I thought it was helpful, like a recap map, I like that rhythm actually. Uh, so we talked about some of the context and the attention versus attention, which was in the, in the slide. Within attention, we talked about rhythms that has that temporality, that propensity, and that idea of knowing from inside. Those are three concepts that really appealed to me. Um, and then we tried to bring that and connect it to designing and what that means for designing and how a humbling position can interact with that. Maybe that should even be two arrows, by the way. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the recap of where we are. Uh, just a reminder that any of those ideas and critiques uh, are directed at myself. You know, you have to ask yourself, like, why is this guy spending so much energy like they're on this? If there's some deficiency with me, definitely there. Um, so keep that in mind. And yeah, as I mentioned, I was going to end with this. So if there's one thing to take away. It's just the idea of thinking uh, about rhythm and rhythmically and thinking over time. When we look at the massive living systems that are in front of us and the things that we work on at those levels, uh, we may start to appreciate uh, when to act, yes, but equally of value, maybe when not to act and what wisdom that may bring. And I'm curious to hear uh, from all of you about in the discussion about what this might inspire or what this might make you think of. So thank you. Uh, there's a long list of ideas left on the cutting room floor. <laughs> I'll leave this up for a minute or two as David kind of moderates us into the discussion section. But um, there's a whole bunch of things that you can talk about. And David Ng and Peter Jones, by the way, have a much more larger body of knowledge into all this. I'm kind of just absorbing some of the things that they're dropping and, and putting them into what works for me. But um, thank you all. And I really appreciate uh, the time to share this. Thanks, Ad. Um, so we have comments coming into the chat. Uh, Stephen Davies, would you like to kick off with some ideas? Well, that was unexpected, David. 
Uh, no, I, I, I love, uh, first of all, thank you that for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, 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 the, the takeaway of rhythm is uh, a wonderful takeaway. And as a, a fan of the Canadian band Rush, um, if you've ever listened to their music, you'll know that they change the time rhythm in their music all the time. And I, I find that to be one of the most fascinating pieces of their music because I still listen, I've been listening to their music now for 35 years and um, it's still fresh, it's still new, it's still delightful. So thank you for the rhythm takeaway, that's lovely. And uh, I wonder then, you know, in that dance of acting and non-acting, what's what sets that rhythm? You know, how do you, the music, what do they say? Music is the pause between the notes. Right. Perhaps designing is the pause between the 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 action. Mm. Um, anyway, I I you know I wrote in the in the uh, chat room around uh, designing, discovering the DAO, and and I really think um, that that's uh, where you're headed. Um, I think there is an uh, uh, an, an eternal philosophy. Uh, and possibly a set of ethical norms. What you didn't touch on was ethical norms for designing, which I was hoping you might touch into, but I do believe that by valuing humility, you're heading in that direction. So I thank you for that. Um, but my question, yeah, that, that leads to my question. Where do you go next, Zad? Where do you go uh, after this? Uh, just a, a brief pause, Zad. Uh, either, uh, I was having problems getting off screen share. You may prob also be getting off screen share. If you're having a problem, bring your presentation back. Um, and, uh, and so we have something to watch as opposed to the screen that we're seeing now. So I just, I just clicked. Ah, I just there clicked we go. Stop now. Yeah, it's good now. Okay. Now you're, going, you're back. Okay, okay. So sorry. So uh, yes. So Stephen had the question. Where next? Where next? Um... You know the cheesy answer, Stephen. Wherever the river takes notice. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it it is some of my focus is actually on a practical level. Those three streams I was talking about actually overlaps with my like work even. So I am kind of um, configuring some of my work to go that direction. Um, and I think what goes next is the con continuing to kind of surface these ideas and and bring them into the design sphere. So, cause there's a lot of ideas that may not have come to that uh, arena. And the one that's particular of interest is like the Islamic design element. Mm. Um, I think like, you know, there is actually a rich body of work and David and Peter actually can speak to it about um, Taoist philosophies and his connection to design and et cetera. I would be really curious to make those connections to the Islamic tradition. And it's not just limited to that. I'm like, if you're like Jesuit or whatever, you know what I mean? I think there's a lot of, um, in the secular arena, we just easily block that out pretty, mm -hmm. pretty like bluntly. <laughs> and I'm wondering, well, like, okay, well, if the natural tendency is to open that um, aperture up more, what else might we bring back in? So I'm, I'm curious. Designing is sacred. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Cool. Um, next comment came from you who, if you, if you'd like to speak. Um, Going along this line a little further, I think. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Do you want to uh, do you want to jump between hands raised and comments? Yes. Maybe? Yes, I'll jump between hands raised. Uh, Susu. Video. Hello, I'm um, not the video. Hi. I don't want to. Okay. No, it's too dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's very. It's like one thirty in the morning. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, I very much like where you're going with in terms of the um, humbling, because in the longitudinal ties in with that. There are many, many elements of longitudinal uh, observation. Um, especially between the um, three and four parts of design, right? So when you're, um, the rhythms are really important, um, anything to do with um, community, all of those elements are tying in very well, and, and including the spirituality. So um, looking at that, you need patience and uh, observation, and that's the kind of a respect. And I think I like the comment that you said about design, perhaps is a bit into impatient. That's what I've observed over the years. We've talked about this, Zad, 
um, a lot, <laughs> and David too, various other people, um, that uh, it's too impatient. Um, and the intent, what is the intent with design, design versus designing? You know, I like the action part of it. So, cause you're obviously aiming for practice. Um, so what is the intent behind the design in and the processes that you're observing and um, what is uh, the patient? What's the, what, you know, you need to humble. What does humbling mean? You know, like what are the different elements of humbling you apply all that? I love how that's all coming together, um, especially going into the um, different traditions. Um, because there's an awful lot of information and perhaps, like you said, this kind of the secular sort of says, oh, well, if I don't need to deal with the spirituality, I can just get rid of that. That's kind of easy. Um, makes it nice and succinct and I don't have to deal with all this messy stuff, which is humbling and, and annoying, you know, and I have to wait. Um, so a lot of uh, practical kinds of designing approaches, <laughs> it just takes time. And who has that? So I guess with wicked problems, which is like you said, it's like not, they're not problems really, you know, like you can observe it and it's a mess and then what, you know, just walk away, okay, map it. But I really like the direction that you're going. So um, uh, any any sort of um, ideas about um, taking the spirituality, the, hum the um, different traditions of observation, within different cultures. Um, you're going to go a bit further with that in terms of practice and applying. Yeah, no, thank you, Susu. I think it's wonderful to hear that that's tracking and thank you for staying up so late. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's very dark. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it was, you know, I did stop my, I mean, I didn't stop myself. I'm not there as to like defining humbling. I don't even know like how to get into that. But what's right. interesting is that there are, without knowing it, there are different ways that people come to a humbling position through, it could be spirituality, it could be trying to climb a mountain, it could be, it could be all sorts of things where you recognize your smallness, you recognize like you're, you're part of something larger, all those types of things you hear people say at those moments when they're taking in something in awe or whatever. I think there's like multiple paths to humility. And so um, that's what I'm interested in is like, what are the types that get you there? And what are the things that maybe give you, <laughs> it's gonna sound harsh, the arrogance feedback loop, right? What are the things that just like keep pumping you up, pumping up your air to the point of like, you can't see your smallness? Yeah, I, I think just quickly to respond to that, it's like, um, yeah, there's many different pathways. Like for example, the Finnish language, that take, just take something really, just Finnish languages, when you translate that Finnish into English, there's lots of pauses and it sounds like you don't know or you're, you, you know, you're focused on something else or you're not paying attention, but the Finnish language has a lot of pauses as part of the language. So if you translate that, that sounds like, oh, you know, uh, yes. And you know, it, so, and this happens with all many different languages. And I'm just talking about language as an example. So, um, so, so what does that mean? So what's the intent behind, you know, so if you're trying to explain the process um, to someone who's, it's an action and what's your intent, um, that could be lost in translation literally um, because of the rhythm is different. So yeah. I really love what you're kind of trying to pull all the fragments together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> see you. All right, see you, Susie. Thanks for staying up. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Solomon. Solomon has his hand up. Okay. All right. Thank you um, for giving me the opportunity. So, Zed, I, have, I had a question regarding uh, time frames. I think you touched on T2, T3, but um, I was just thinking that in, in a short time, it gets really easy to get sucked into a Messiah complex, I feel, where the designer is sort of the the spiritual leader slash messiah and is supposed to very quickly come up with something um and hand the tablets over quickly and get get on with it um sorry i'm using a religious uh, sort of analogy but that's that's um that's what i feel that in in shorter time frames that 
that's easy to do, right? It's a quick fix. Um, but when you're looking at a longer time frame and you're looking at other non-human actors, like uh, if we can bring uh, plants and animals into the system somehow, if they can be given a voice, I don't know how that works, but it, I think it's possible. Um, so if we can have the planet speak, so to speak, uh, we will find that humans are, will find it easier to be humble is what I'm getting at. Um, the, the, second, the, the second thought that I had when I was listening in was sometimes I think we suffer from a lack of epistemological depth. Um, and, and what we're basically doing is we're either relying on our senses or rely, relying on science or pseudoscience to answer all the questions. Whereas there are many different epistemologies and ontologies in the world, uh, which have existed well before the advent of modern science, for example. Um, and, and somehow it's like the new uh, epistemology is all about uh, what we can see and observe and rationally deduce. There are many other ways of knowing as well. Uh, and, and I feel that the more we explore that, the more humble we can be perhaps. So, um, so, so the first one was a question for you about the time frame thing. How do you, how do you think about that? The second one may be just me rattling off. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I love Salman rattling off, so keep it up. Um, actually, either David or Peter, I'm going to do my my attempt, and then maybe one of you two could come in on the time frame because we talked about teleology. To to me, I see like I already mixed it up. But um, Salman, one of the concepts we we've, we've been talking about in system change and learning is: can you work towards an ideal in the short term? And perhaps that is an erroneous position to start with or a problematic position because um, you're not, yeah, like you said, you're not appreciating that longevity um, of knowledge of what, what there is to ascertain. This, this, comes, this connects to your second point as well, right? The, the, the longevity. Um, so I've started to personally start to appreciate, like I was that person. I was like, what's the, what's the uh, I'm starting to like, I'm actually still working through it, which is why I'm struggling to respond to it, but maybe you can't do the best thing in that moment at that time, but you can do what's like practical. You can do what's available. You can do what you're sensing that you're able to do. Um, and this brings into this question um, uh, about teleology, purposefulness or purposive. And David, I was wondering if maybe, or Peter, if you want to speak to those concepts, because I think is really relevant here and a good way to bring them in. Um, sure, I can speak to that. Um, so uh, this is uh, leaning on Russ Acoff, the most published author in systems thinking, um, and his original work was on on purposeful systems. And uh, the, dif the, the distinctions he made were between purposeful, which is um, ideal and not achievable, and purposive, which is a goal that's achievable within a period, so like a month, a year, whatever you want to specify. And so when he actually took his dissertation and published it as a book in 1972 with Fred Emery on purposeful systems, Emery some years later came out and said that he didn't believe that groups of people could share ideals. They can share goals. And so for a next month, like we don't have to fight or whatever, we can just agree to do something together for a month. After that, it's kind of like all bets are off. And so the, the issue on whether doing less on a shorter period of time, as Solomon asks, um, that's, not, uh, that's not ideal, or as uh, Zad is saying, pragmatic, that's to be an interesting question. Uh, let me just add something briefly to that. I'd look at the cybernetic concept of order, um, not orders of system, but thinking about order of design as a control system. And so that if we have long-term ideals, it's, it's a higher order of designing, not in design 1.0 to 4.0, but in terms of a shorter term um, purposive project, in other words, is going to be a first order of design that's intentional, that has a deadline, an, out, an outcome, uh, an output that will have an outcome that, uh, and if you're working with an organization or stakeholders, 
they're going to constitute a control system at a level of collaborative designing. That's you could say that's a second order system at the, at the closest level of design team. But there's also a third order of design for for uh, for the ima the imagining of the longer term outcomes that we expect. And this is where you know long term theories of change or systemic theories of change comes into play. So we think about a kind of Batesonian order of design. There has to be more humility in that in that third order where we the best we can do maybe is to construct you know the requisite variety of of the responsive stakeholders that are going to care for those outcomes and to you know maintain if to to bring back that other metaphor of maintenance that we have kind of a sustain that and to me this would be the essence of sustainability is to take this third order nurturing long-term perspective Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything further to add, Salman, other than uh, I think that's a really valuable discussion that this brings up. And then uh, you've also, your question also touches on what Susu was saying, is that different ways into humility. And I think that's a wonderful thought and it's a continuous theme. So thanks. Okay, I'm working my way down, down the hand raised list. So Steve Waddell has his hand up. Ah. Uh. Here I am. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I thought I would just give, share a reflection that arose in me. And um, then there's a, a, an inquiry. And the reflection is a memory, one of my most embarrassing memories, um, which is I was in the Philippines in like 1995, and I'd gone out and looked at some very interesting multi-stakeholder uh, NGO-led uh, housing development projects. And I went back and a USAID who was funding this trip wanted to have some recommendations about what should be done. And I obliged them and gave my recommendations. And afterwards I thought, oh my God, that is just like, what do I know about this situation? I have been here for a few days. <laughs> I know so little about the situation. And the reflection is just how often um, uh, we're thrown into a situation where people want to have an answer. And um, it's hard to push back um, sometimes. And it's one of uh, what I heard you striving for, Zaid, is is being reflective and being able to push back, which is a tremendously valuable quality about trying to encourage people to say, it's just, you know, I'm not the right person to say that, or it's not the right time, or something like that. I really appreciate that. Um, one of the, uh, so I heard what you said really is about a, a big philosophy of life, which I, um, immensely value about your exploration into it. Uh, one of the challenges we have is around intent. And Peter touched on this too in his last comments about different levels of purposefulness and intent and how to work with those because there's a time dimension as well that's possible. And I know I hear you as being having a purposeful life. And so the question is really about how you manage or how you um, evolve with intent and purposefulness. Um, it's part of your life that you're bringing forward. And then there's the sort of the projects and the work we do with others and it's such a, a rich area for exploration. I really thank you for your reflections. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the, the reflection you shared about your experience. And, and that was part of the, even the hesitation. That's why I buried my reflection at the end of my MRP. I'm like, I'm not brave enough to share this. I'm going to put it at the last page so no one reads it, basically. <laughs> but here I am doing the opposite of it, like three years later. I'm like, OK, maybe there's something there. Um, so Steve, I don't, I don't know. I don't know uh, how you push back and how you find that. I think 
one of the things that I've started to think about in, in terms of like the streams I was talking about was um, actually David Hawk, who's a guest on the Systems Thinking Ontario previously, he comes on, he talked about being an advisor because an advisor, like having literally just getting down to the practical, like titling and positioning your role with them because advisor, you can, you can kind of, a uh, consultant, like you're getting paid to like deliver that thing. You know what I mean? And an advisor can be like, here's what to do, take it or leave it. <laughs> like if you can get to that level of a position or have a position, I also, also sometimes talk like critical distance, but I know that sounds like an oxymoron because I talked about knowing from the inside, but that critical distance to be like, look, I, we can take a pause. We can, we can look at this, take a step back. We don't have to act now, et cetera. So the advisory role is something I'm interested in figuring out, like, how do you get there? And it's like an oxymoron of humility. It's like, oh, I'm an advisor. Well, I'm not trying to be an advisor. Um, I'm just saying there's another way. Um, Peter, one thing you talked about the other day or, or even a personal comment was about getting to the student mind, getting to the beginner mindset. Does that play a role in how you can bring up critical perspectives? Well, yeah, I think every beginner's mind, not even the student mind, which is seeking, but beginner's mind, anything which is curious, and open and and knowing that and and uh, it can be not just a, an acknowledgement that you don't know, which is one thing, but I think the beginner's mind is is a choice to be unknowing and to allow and to allow learning to occur more peripherally and through the propensity. I mean, we tend to be sometimes greedy or uh, you know. Uh, Maybe greedy is not the right word. I shouldn't say that, you know, with all the all the students I work with, but um, but uh, accumulative in our approach to learning, where we can't get enough, or we pile it on more. And there's a way which the conversation you've approached part of its humility here, I'd have to say, is actually um, going deep with a few ideas, recognizing how how expansive this could be, but you've uh, opened up this space. I know I may not be answering the question, but I just do want to say you've opened up the space in this in this depth and just a few key juxtapositions and ideas to allow this kind of beginners to, to create a kind of stimulation in beginner's mind. Like maybe there is a way you've presented it where you've acknowledged you don't, you don't you're putting yourself in a position of humility and we're following you with that. And now we're we're all kind of going into a humble inquiry, which is one of the other references. I think we were discussing the, you know, that, um, you know, that, you know, the, the, the style of inquiry that, um, that is open to, to continuous learning uh, rather than a seeking for the answer or to answer the answer. One other point, I just don't want to lose thought of it might connect to another thing. And I don't, I want to take the time to get to the other hands up as well on the discussions, but um, it also made me realize, Steve, in, a, in thinking about your question, Peter, your reflection as well, is you can shed the language that's expected. I think that's also interesting when you can just like dump it all out and be like, you're not taking any of those presuppositions of how like the embedded meanings are coded and whatever, and just come at it uh, from, the, from that angle is maybe an interesting way to provoke that humble inquiry. So that, that was a thought that might have been on the long list, but anyways, felt relevant. Thank you, Steve. Okay, should we move on to Madeline? Sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to offer kind of a more like a grounded example of that was coming to mind based on what you shared. Um, I have been getting interested in the field of ecosystem restoration. Um, and that to me is a group of people, a really eclectic group of people um, and governments and organizations who are, um, you know, wading straight into that territory of humble attention, rethinking like what, what are the right interventions in a living system when do we do nothing? What are the consequences of doing nothing, um, particularly in a climate change world? So yeah, this question I think is being grappled with um, in so many different localities. Also like here in the US, the federal land agencies, you know, the, some of our 
theories around wilderness and what does stewardship mean are kind of breaking down. Um, so yeah, that is kind of what's coming to mind for me. It's look, I'm planning to actually make this sort of a subject of my design dissertation, looking into this set of practices and saying, is this designing? Why or why not? Is restoration and conservation a model for a humble kind of designing that's about stewardship and conservation? Um, so yeah, just want to share that example that's coming to mind for me. I'm using theories of change as a lens into those eclectic practices and saying, like, what are the theories that a government might bring to the work of restoring ecosystems versus um, a group of indigenous activists versus a nonprofit working in a watershed, et cetera, and they're trying to tie them together around the idea of design. So nice, beautiful. Thank you for sharing those connections. Yeah. And Madeline, if you don't mind expanding actually on is this part of that work at CMU Transition Design Program where you're also somewhat, I guess, in a way, critiquing the, the, the model of, of transition design and change? Do you want to expand on that? We talked about that. Like, a, This might be interesting for the group as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is. So it's definitely a continuation of, for me, the same line of thinking around like um using theory of change and a very kind of loose understanding of it, more like how do people think change happens? Right. Um, and how, what are our ways of drawing that out and getting it more out in the open, turning the implicit into the explicit? So yeah, I think my research is trying to at the same time also offer an example of how we can like use theory of change as a way of inquiring about the politics and the methods of different designerly interventions. Um, yeah, and yeah, related to transition design. It's, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, I only bring that up because there's a lot of students here from SFI and a lot of the community with systemic design. So it feels like a nice bridge and connection between our friends at CMU, Carnegie Mellon, that are working the uh, transition design program. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thanks, Ed. yeah. Uh, Kelly. Ooh. <laughs> I, I'm off mute. Uh, okay, so um, I'm a colleague of, of Zad's on the system changes learning uh, group, and my background has changed. So systems has been uh, a, a, a big uh, a challenge in terms of like just getting a grasp on it. Uh, so firstly, Zad, uh, congratulations, you, you grabbed a lot of um, these really uh, big concepts into the presentation and I really appreciate the way that you were able to deliver them. So thanks very much. Uh, you know, I, I just coming back to the, this, this focus on, on humble and just uh, um, my, my own personal focus at the moment is on care and quality and that, that missing aspect in terms of my area's new product development. So I, I kind of wondered, you know, like when we're looking at care, it also follows the new management um, shift in terms of being top down to being management by how can I support you to do your job? And just th that ability to be um, able to say, I don't know, but, but together we can probably, you know, look into it. It gives us a whole different area uh, to be able to approach problem solving in terms of design. If design is 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 looking at problem solving uh, as a generality, then you know when I worked as a consultant and had to know the answers, going into this area of humble learning uh, to listen more, and I, I've absolutely been in in corporate meetings where somebody. Um, not, not from the design team or not from management, but they had something to add that was really important uh, to have that voice being being heard. So I, I hope that this, uh, I, I certainly believe in, in this work with uh, David to be a different way of looking at it than what, what is typically coming through a lot of the MBA programs in terms of being right and top down. Uh, so anyhow, th those are just some of the points and or, or the comments in terms of what is humble. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Yeah, 
Likewise, thanks, Kelly. Yeah. Okay. Were, were you expecting an answer, Kelly? You were, you were sharing, right? I, I felt that you were just sharing, reflecting. No, well, well I was picking up on, on your piece about uh, what is humble. And yeah. I, I guess my, uh, my comment to you was, hey, good job. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thank you. <laughs> okay, Eve. Uh, my question is, what's the relationship between systems communication and the theory of change of Professor Jones? What was the second part of that question? The relationship between systems communications and? Yeah. Theory of change, is that? Oh, theory of change. Um, Oh, um, both of them, I can, uh, I can attempt to answer that. Both of them strive towards trying to reflect, trying to better reflect real world complexity. Or you could say they're trying to, they're trying to um, not be so reductive in their representation. So a theory of change from Peter Jones and Ryan Murphy's work, they have a good layout that there's a logic model and that logic model is often linear. You do this, you achieve this, you get this impact, et cetera. But that's not necessarily a reflection of uh, the real world complexity, especially in those domains. And so systems communication is somewhat similar from what I'm trying from like a spiritual point, not the, from like an ethos, I mean, in that um, you can go out there and say this is your rallying cry or campaign message or this is the way forward. But you're not really reflecting the fact that there's equally contested ways to engage in that situation. And my suggestion is just by mere recognizing that there's another way, you've already opened the door wide open in a good way, in a net positive. But our dynamics don't do that. And sometimes I have a joke of like, what if the politician's like, um, I'm not sure actually. Like they would be thrown off the stage, right? Like the, it wouldn't work like that in our cultural context. But um, I'm provoking the thought of like, maybe there's other ways to reflect that. So that's the connection that I see between them. They start from the ethos of trying to not reduce the real world complexity as far uh, as the as the format as the template actually does. Oh, you might, yeah. You know, I wonder if you want to add to you know the theory of change doesn't tell you what to do, but it's a framework for the observation of of outcomes to impacts to. To, to achieving a, a telos or a goal. It's, it, and there could be a real difference in the way that communications are formed for different styles of theory of change. Uh, an intentional directive, you know, a kind, kind of aggressive theory of change might be to, I, might be to identify uh, systemic communications as the need to construct a narrative, which is then kind of force fed through the different outputs and to propagate through outcomes. And that narrative is kind of managed through a process. A propensity orientation to a theory of change is understanding that, that people can absorb, pick up and reflect and participate in communications, might approach you know, your systemic communication instead of strategic, where instead of a narrative, we, we create awareness about the different perspectives and let people reflect on them and come to being. And then we can just, like I was suggesting in this kind of cultivation, uh, cultivation or uh, maintenance of, of the process over time that, that we can nurture the, the, and reinforce the approaches that, that, that make sense for the time. Because also to pick up on kind of Stephen's um, uh, Dao Te Ching quote, in a sense, if we look at a Taoistic approach to that, the Taoist never knows whether something is good or bad at the time that it happens. I mean, they don't want to judge an immediate reaction because, yeah. because reaction has an action, has a reaction, has another, has other. I mean, they, they, they saw this thousands of years ago, yeah. that, you know, that we participate in, the, in this series in, in multiple causalities. And if we try to push it, we might become then the actor that has things occur with, with consequences that we cannot envision. 
And so rather than trying to push the consequences that we believe will happen intentionally, we can more or less follow it, maintain it, and nurture it, and, and respect those cycles, um, uh, you know, rather than try. And, and of course, we, in real life, we don't always do this. <laughs> you know, in the action of working with clients and with projects and research, we have to get things done. But there is a way that we can, you know, really think, take that longer view and this approach. And I, I resist narrative construction in this way. It comes up a lot in theory of change. Mm -hmm. that we're constructing the right narrative. And we just believe, you know, the idea is that that narrative is somehow going to propagate in this first order construct. People will adhere to it and kind of follow it through. And it's not their narrative. We're pushing it on them. And right. we need yeah. to allow these things to emerge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you you had your hand up. So yeah, I just jumped yeah. in. Yeah, I mean it's not so much that it's a narrative, but that it's a single narrative, right? And mm -hmm. that you're you're pushing a single narrative. And I, I put the quote in the chat box a while back that, you know, Bateson like um to quote William Blake um on on uh you know that that got us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. Um, and I, yeah, I put that in my dissertation, but, um, and I, you know, I mean, I've run into theory of change as an evaluator and, um, it emerged in evaluation back in the 1990s when people were trying to figure out how to deal with evaluating, um, complex community initiatives, um, you know, in other words, how, and, and answering the question of how do you know that the interventions worked or, or not? And, uh, and what, how do you describe the intervention in the first place? But, um, and I am, you know, one of my anthropological colleagues that I was working with as an evaluator, I mean, we, we had trouble with um, a, a lot of the evaluation practice around that was then and still is to try to get um, consensus on, around a theory of change. And, and we felt that, you know, you can push that way too fast. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, collective impact is very, you know, dominant in, in, in the U.S. as a way to approach complex interventions. And again, you know, the problem I have with collective impact is, you know, everybody's supposed to align. You're supposed to get a, you know, group of stakeholders in a room and all, you know, I'll get them to agree on the theory of change and on what the indicators are. And, and a lot of times, you know, that gets pushed fast and it gets pushed by the funders and a lot of times, you know, and, and frankly, in, in that kind of context, what people call theory of change, a lot of times it's just like, you know, the, the funder gives you a logic model and you have to follow it. And, um, and then, and yeah, so, so I'm working now in these projects where um, the public health departments, we've got a lot of money now, but it's temporary and people are, are trying to think about you know, what do we do with this influx of cash that's presumably going to go away um, that, that is going to produce some kind of sustainable change? And there's a lot of talk about health and racial equity um, as, you know, longer term outcomes, but and, 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 and some pressure to try to figure out, you know, what the roadmap is when I, I think maybe a little bit of not knowing would go a long way. But um, I, I, um, one of the things that gets in the way is the, the construction of, of experts and expert knowledge and, and people in public health right now are struggling with that. Um, and one person I really respect is Michael Osterholm. And if you've ever listened to his podcast, he's very humble. I, I mean, his last podcast, he was saying repeatedly that, that he doesn't know and that that he wishes, you know, more of the people who are um, claiming expertise would acknowledge what, what we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, but, you know, getting people comfortable with the idea of not knowing is, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, <laughs> I, I won't claim that I know how to do that. <laughs> Um, you know, I do know that, you know, as others of you have said, that there's, there's centuries of, of wisdom around this. And, and I've, I've found that in the, the Zen Sangha that, that I belong to. And um, I, I put in the chat box the stuff about the Sufi story of fire, 
I don't know if any of you know that story, but it was mm -hmm. written in the 12th century. Mm -hmm. And there was supposed to be a man named Noor that went around and taught um, five tribes how to make and use fire. But then several generations later, there's a teacher and his disciples that go around to these five tribes and the disciples are trying to talk to them about fire and they discover there's one tribe that uses fire the way Nora intended for them to use fire. But the other ones, some of them worship fire making but have lost the knowledge about how to make fire. And when the di disciples come in and try to talk to them about it, they say, you know, well, we have our customs and you don't know them. And, you know, we don't wanna hear what you have to say. And then for other, other groups, so, um, there's a small priestly class that has the knowledge of fire, but again, you know, they don't want it to be spread in, into uh, society at large. And, and, and the, the finally, you know, the teacher says to his disciples, well, you have to realize it's not a matter of what there is to be taught, but what people think there is to be learned. And you have to figure that out before you can teach them anything. And so that story makes that equation between learning and, and, and social change. And I think though it is pretty humbling to think about, yeah, well, people have been grappling, well, probably, you know, as long as we've been people, we've been grappling with these kinds of questions. Stephen, you had your hand raised. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, I just, I, I'm gonna, bridge off the, the 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 last concept which you landed on is that which was humbling um and, and then what i would consider to be the adjacent attitude of humility um and and, and link it to the to the process orientation that you're describing as well as the designing orientation that many of us uh use and and just tie it together with this notion that we need there's a there's a level of requisite humility that is required in process leadership design process leadership that actually admits the various perspectives um, that have been referred to here uh, including and 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 doesn't um elevate the lead designer's perspective as being the preferred perspective or the um, you know, the, the, the sanctioned perspective. Um, and so I, I, I really, I really love that you've landed on humility and humbleness, because I think as if in any kind of design process leadership, there has to be an element of not knowing and, and not knowing how things are, are going to turn out. And I'm in exactly this position in a very complex engagement at the city of Kitchener. Um, we're trying to do things with the city of Kitchener. I have no idea if it's going to work. Um, and I'm going to be really upfront with the working group next week. And I'm going to tell them, hey, folks, there's a real possibility. We're going to fail on this. And so let's be prepared for that. Um, um, I, I, you know, I, we, will lead, we will lead a process, but we need everybody in the working group to own that process with us. And, and we're gonna figure it out together. Um, and, and, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm, I have to, I, I'll admit, I, I spend a lot of my time absolutely terrified of what we're trying to do because I don't know how we're gonna do it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that example, Stephen. I think that's a really concrete example of the terror that like we, we, all, we all feel. I was wondering, Stephen, if I can flip my own opinion just to like, give another angle to what you're sharing is like, you know how we talked about wisdom in the context? I wonder if that taking humility to the extreme, could that ever be problematic? Like, would you want to give a sense of comfort and confidence to a person who um, needs to know that for that time being? And, and you know what I mean? And that, is that like the actual effort What's that? What's the term ethical or for needs like the right thing in the right moment for the right person at the right time? It's almost like mm -hmm. etiquette, behavior, attitude. I wonder, I'm challenging myself to say taking a motorboat of humility and running it over everyone may not be right either. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I'm going to use an analogy like you used, um, you used water skiing and surfing. 
my preferred analogy for surfing is I use whitewater rafting. Mm. Um, and you know, when you when you're in, if you've ever gone white river raft, white whitewater rafting, there's a guide at the back of the boat boat. And everybody has their own paddles. And he he or she has to assess of the paddlers in the boat in the various positions in the boat, which and their various all the different levels of competency and the conditions on the river and getting everybody safely to the end of the to the end of the end of the river, you know. There's so many variables there um, uh, that, that, that they can't be mastered. They can only be, you know, interacted with. You know, you may discover that an instruction to, you know, the teenage boy at the front right to put, you know, oar in the water at 12 o'clock and pull hard, doesn't, he doesn't have the competency to execute on that. Whereas it turns out that the grandmother on the left side of the boat, third from the front, has an intuitive sense of how to guide in the water and she is doing most of the work when everybody else thinks they are. So I, I just, I, I, it's, it's an art. I think it, it comes yeah. to, I think there's art here. It's, and, and it's, it's, it's not, you know, we will never fully know. There are, th there are, there are things that we will never know here. Yeah. And you talked about the rush, the rush example, and even, and, you know, in the live shows or whatever, like jam bands, right? Like you're going to like, or jazz mu music, it's an art. You're like, okay, I kind of know the tempo and key. I don't know where we're going to land, but here's how I think that drummer, you know, that drummer is a little pissed off today. So they're playing a little more, more aggressive. So I might have to keep up with that staccato or whatever. Yeah, it's definitely an art. That's a great example, Stephen. It also sticks with it. It actually has the, it maintains the cybernetics uh, <laughs> metaphor in it too. That's a great one. I'm gonna I'm gonna borrow that if I can from you. <laughs> Take it, <laughs> Peter. It looks like uh, have your hand up. Oh uh, yeah, I'd like to follow that. Actually, I thought the um, the question about can can we be humble while bringing confidence, or this kind of contrast between how we might think that might be the case. When, so Ed Shine's humble inquiry is about somebody who's already in, and it's written for executives and it's a leadership manual in a sense. It's about uh, always asking questions from the perspective that somebody who's in a, who's in a formal status, who's in a position of formal status, much lower than the executive to whom the book's written to. But you can also use this approach for anything when there's not that disparity. With that disparity, though, what it is is reminding the, the leader that, that they're going to learn more and they're going to inform themselves and be seen as a better leader. And they're going to, they're going to also imbue the situation in this relationship you know, with, with their employee or with somebody who's in a lower position. The humble inquiry is a matter of you know, ask, being able to ask directions if you're not sure, or being able to ask a question framed in a kind of everyday, not like, like I just, like I, there are things uh, about the situation that I don't know, or asking about a project, but not assuming that, you know, well, because you're an executive, you don't know the technique, you know, you don't know about the technology, not having to reveal that you know something, and you're pseudo smart, like, politicians do all the time, but instead asking questions from a, pers from a perspective of actually, you know, being, being actually equal, being, or even lower from a humble perspective. And what, what this reminds me of is also the kind of Christian virtues of faith, hope, and charity, that we can have an obligation of providing, of being charitable. That is, regardless of our situation, it may be charitable to offer to create hope by working with situations, you know, there's never a conversation that's the final conversation. You know, if we're working with organizations that are really desperate to get funding and they're strategic in their, in their strategic funding, you know, their funding strategy, let's say, requires them to have a very well-formed theory of change with pretty explicit uh, points of action that are going to be funded and evaluated and constructed as, you know, as a, you know, as, as something of even, perhaps even a formal logic model. And, and we, you know, and to actually kind of take this position of too much humility into that type of consulting would be perhaps 
you know, uh, that would be eroding their hope. And it would be also uncharitable because we know the situation that they're in. And we can actually have faith that the situation will work out. That is that there will be other conversations in which they'll learn and that we can interact with the funder and that we can have more, we can win other you know, battles to use that more metaphor later as we're achieving larger purposes. So not every engagement, not every interaction has to be a place where, you know, there, there can be humility at different positions, I guess I'm trying to say here too. But I think that there's a, uh, you know, an, an obligation for us as designers to kind of create a context for what might be thought of. Maybe, maybe there are better words for this. I know one of my teachers um, used expectancy instead of faith because she thought people really didn't understand what faith meant. So it's like expectancy that we have a firm idea of the, 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 the benevolence of our outcome. Um, that we are moving in the in the right direction, and uh, and so there's and, and that's uh, an ethical stance as well. It doesn't have to be. I mean, there's even there's both the virtue and consequentialism. There, there's the virtue of maintaining these vir of these virtues, but then there's also that we believe that co you know consequences will evolve in such a way that this is the this is a disposition we can take. Um, yeah, I didn't have my hand up for that, but it did come up, you know, as a response to your question as like, that is a really interesting way to, to, to put ourselves into practice. And it's non-interventional. It's, it's consultative and non-interventional, and it could be part of a humble inquiry. And I'm not good at this. I'm, I forget to be, hum, you know, humble. I'm helpful. And I do that to make up for her. <laughs> I'm not very humble if you know me, but I, um, and, and one of the, the other non-humble people that I respect a lot is a Bruno Latour who hasn't come up and it would be, uh, it would be a miss to leave this discussion. And that's what my hand up was, hand, hand up was for is this is kind of my, Bruno Latour is always like the philosopher's trump card that can go anywhere because he's the, you know, postmodernist, but actually like this Jesuit theologian, you know, theologian at the same time as his depth of history and anti-modernist. And, and he always seems to have the, the bon mot. And here, his paper, A Cautious Prometheus, on which was a presentation from 2008 uh, Design, Research, uh, Design Research Society or, uh, in, in the UK. And even, a, in fact, it was a small group. It wasn't like a major DRS conference or anything. Uh, but a cautious Prometheus gets to his point. He's not a designer. And so I have to kind of laugh when you read this here, I'll put it in the chat, that in, and designers will laugh when he actually says that there's an inherent humility to designing because he's coming in as a philosopher and he's contrasting the design exploration as compared to the builder, the building mentality where there's a thing to build and, you know, we're going to, we're going to deliver that project, you know, as, you know, as we intended. And that's the intentional orientation. And the designers often seem to wander. And it doesn't mean we're not intentional, but there is, you know, this kind of discovery and this, you know, there is a, an acceptance of complexity that is in designing. And he gets into that in a, and even the title of the lecture, A Cautious Prometheus, is a way of imbuing Prometheus, who was, arrogant enough to steal fire from the gods, but to be cautious about the use of that fire and, and what it might mean and about creating meaning with things. And so I have to say, even the way you've actually, re you've done a recapitulation here of, of Latour by describing thingification, because that's, that's almost exactly what he takes and he takes it from Heidegger too. So there is Heidegger's German Eve might know this, um, someone might know the, there is a thingification which comes out of Heidegger that Latour brings into the cautious Prometheus, which is the creating of things with meaning to make them matters of concern. That in 2008, he was saying like at that, at this time, it's a kind of a message of Kairos that at this time we are in a strange time where designers are really now working with other collaborators. I mean, we're all in a collaborative kind of place now. 
And, you know, this was a long time ago, even so we're like 15 years ago now. And so that was, so this was, this was that we we're moving from a place of designing for objects or matters of fact and moving to matters of concern, which are, well, like Madeline mentioned, like climate change, like uh, war versus peace or for the appropriate foreign policy or like um, uh, ecosystem sustainable ecosystems while we're working with you know large cities or Stephen's example of you know working with municipality these are all matters of concern and we have to approach them with some humility because the matters of concern themselves reflect you know they come back to us as well but we are making but I also see there's a danger in in making objects into things or con matters of concern because once we thingify you know, we're reifying and we then believe that that thing has become a thing in which it's important and that it, the meaning that we've created is somehow then has a life of its own or something. And, and Latour doesn't get into that so much, but he does have these, uh, you have to look at this paper for those that haven't seen it. We used to read this in my research methods course and not the systems, the systemic design course, which you probably ought to be required reading in that now. Um, oh. I want yeah. to break in. Uh, Sama has never a chance to speak yet. Oh, yeah, sure. Speaking of Sama. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I, I, I'm really appreciating all this discussion. It's, um, I haven't spoken, like I haven't had, had, had comments because there's a lot to think about in the presentation. So thank you so much, Dad, for this um, really thought-provoking um, session. I guess the, the comment that I had is really regarding humility and the question of what what is humility? And um, I think one of the thought the thoughts that occurred to me is, can we, you've mentioned it already, can we take humility to an extreme that might be harmful? And I think that can be, that's an important possibility that I, it's probably something that we can, as humans do, we can take it to an extreme. For example, um, if we do take humility to avoid responsibility or are we taking humility to um, give room for, for another um, perspective? So I think it all goes back to not just what is humility, but why humility, which goes back, kind of closes the circle back to intention. The way, the way I'm seeing it is that we're, we're back to intention, but it's kind of an, like another iteration of intention that's kind of inward and more more personal, I think. Um, yeah, that's, that's just my comment that I really appreciate this kind of discussion. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really profound point about uh, the intention of humility. Imagine, you know, speaking of connecting Peter thingification and intention of humility, imagine you had like your humility index or your humility meter or whatever. That would be the opposite, right? It, it wouldn't be there. So yeah, I don't think that's the thing about these nebulous ideas. Sometimes you can't concretize them. And so uh, assessing the attention, yeah, that's a really good, really good point. So I really value that. And, and Peter, what you brought forth about thingification and Latour was, was valuable as well. Thanks. Um, Kelly has her hand up and we're nearing our time. So Kelly may get the last question or comment. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to be really quick. Um, you know, I just wanted to follow up on the last comment in terms of humility and ju just the idea uh, uh, of the, the comment of knowing from within and what's in our heads versus what our heads are inside um, is a great opportunity for humility across the, uh, in, in a group setting in terms of we all can accept the fact that we don't know everything. And I think that, that going from that place gives us that opportunity to be in that humility without um, being uh, without ego or without goals or, um, you know, a, a, a group focus. I, I don't know if that, that, that gives some sort of context in terms of the humility that we're seeking towards uh, achievement. Okay, so I don't have any, I don't know, <laughs> does anybody want to challenge that? I just wanted to add that to, uh, to, to the piece on, on humility. Yeah, no, I, uh, 
I think, yeah, they're all, there's so much <laughs> that like, I'm like, yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely a lot to unpack there. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to be double, triple ironic, but I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't, these are all legitimate questions about um, humility. I think even the extreme versions of it are great. And uh, um, I'm just being mindful that Peter sent me something because uh, Patricia, who um, does a lot of the sketch notes um, for uh, various organizations, including the RSD and OCAD community has created this as we were chatting. So oh wow, share that. Um, hey, where are you? Where no, she's being humble. She's, she sat in the background, didn't, didn't want to introduce and was um, sitting um, uh, cross-legged on the floor, sketching this the whole time and seeing the screen and, and delivered it and left <laughs> <laughs> with her blessing. <laughs> That's humble. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Peter, for sharing that. Um, what time do we usually run to, David? Like, I because I, I know we went hand raised questions. Was there questions like were there top ranked comments as well? I couldn't obviously I couldn't follow as well. Uh, no, we pretty well covered everyone, and so okay. we usually wrap up around now. So um, okay. I think I think we're going to call today. Um, and uh, for people looking for next month to something in Ontario, uh, Peter will send me messages about the students from the SFI program who will be volunteering to um, show their work. How's that coming, Peter? Uh, I guess are they all through course now? Are they done? Oh yeah, no. Today, today the grades are supposed to be in, and I'm just happy that I haven't seen, you know, a an email from grad studies saying where are they because they might be. It's been an it's been a really unusual term. We started a month, really a month later, practically. You know, from the first week of January, it was bumped to the last day in January for the first day of classes for us. And so everything is, is, is off a bit, but we're still trying to make, make today to get it in. So I'm still looking over them. They're, you know, writing comments for those who remember how that, how that has gone in the past. If you've been the recipient of these comments, we really look at these, you know, closely and try to, you know, try to provide some sort of thoughtful reflection on all of them. So I'm, I'm still immersed in that and hope to be done today. And and I think we're, we'll have a really good, you know, set. So we'll have at least June covered and, and then maybe, you know, we'll see if we have three or two or three for each of the months. So we'll, we'll try to get three in June. So, okay. yeah. Pretty good. yeah. Great. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Bye. Thanks.